in January, I began to, sh to share my heart that this year was going to be your best year ever. Believe that God wanted to do certain things in our midst. Can you pull it, Jason? God wanted to do certain things in our midst um, in such a way that we're changed forever. That this would be a year of provision, a year of jubilee where debts and, and bondages are broken off. A year of the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our church, in our community like it's never seen before. And we're a few months into that and the truth is I still believe that we're heading in that direction. God wants to do a mighty work in our midst. He's begun it and we're believing Him to complete it. Amen? Amen. Part of that process is we've been talking about growing in grace, about knowing who we are in Christ, about being uh, spiritually mature, about being able to walk in the fullness of His power, about allowing the Holy Spirit to permeate us in such a way that we carry that anointing and that presence everywhere we go. That you would host the presence of God in such a way that you can walk into the family reunion and the people are ready to receive simply because you came in. That you can walk into a, a city, a home, the workplace, your high school, and the presence of the Lord so permeates us that people are drawn to you and to salvation. That's our goal. That this year, we would be a mighty army. And part of that is, we need to understand this truth. We need to understand these keys of the King. Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 and 22. If you'll turn with me there. I'd like to read those this morning. And we're going to begin here. But I'm going to give you five keys this morning. Don't get nervous. Even though I said five, I will not be that long. I know five for me is big, but I, I, I really try to do this. But these are the five things we need to put in our lives to live the kingdom. Scripture teaches us that the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, not what we eat, not what we have, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Micah 6.8 tells us that God, he has shown me, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. That's what these keys are going to show us. Now, how many of you know there are two distinct purposes for keys? What are they? To lock and unlock. To open or to close. And our goal this morning is to open those things to our lives that God wants to open and to close the doors for those things that God wants to close so that we can walk in the fullness of His power, so that we can understand what God has done for us, what He wants to do with us, what He wants to do through us, how that each and every one of us have a call, each and every one of us have a purpose, there are no mistakes in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've been through. God is an all-powerful God, and He has a call, and He has a purpose for every single life here this morning. There are no exceptions. God, not only does He want you to be complete, not only wants to be healed and whole, not only does he desire you to move into a place where you are productive for his kingdom. When we do those things, he promises that we will see blessings and provision from on high. Isaiah chapter 22, verses 20 to 22, it says, Then it shall come to pass that in that day, that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hekah, and I will clothe him with a robe, and strengthen him with thy, with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. 
In Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, I write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David. How many of you want to know what this key of David is? I'm going there a little bit. <laughs> we want to know. He that opened and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man opened. I know thy works. Behold, I have set thee before an open door, which no man can shut. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So we, right now, in Isaiah and in Revelation, God is speaking about the key of David. What is this key of David? What is it that we need to understand about it? Well, let me give you just some simple truths. In Bible times, now can you imagine this? I have keys, right? Now, you know, this isn't bad. That's a pretty big key. In Bible times, it could be up to two feet in length. Wow, you're going to carry that around to open the door, huh? Um, but that, that's just a fact. And whatever they could conveniently carry, I don't know how you carry it, you know, strap it on your back, hopefully that's not the front door, hopefully that's the key to the city. But the, key, the Hebrew word key is, tran is translated, its root means to open or to loose or to set free. The Greek word, it means to shut, close, to obstruct or withhold. Since the keeper of the keys has the power to open and shut, the key denotes power and authority in the Bible. Now we want to understand what this key of David consists of and what it does. Because in Isaiah he said, I, can, I will open the door and no man can close it. I will shut the door and no man can open it. In Revelation, in the church of Philadelphia, the only church to get a positive report card, he gave them, again, the key of David. No man can close the doors that I open. No man can shut that, open that what I've shut. So we need to understand. Now, when we look at Isaiah, the Assyrian army had invaded Judah just as Isaiah had won. But the Jewish leaders were trusting in their political alliance with Egypt and not in God, Jehovah, to deliver the nation. One of the treacherous leaders, whose name was Shebna, who had used the office for his own private gain, had betrayed them. God said that he would be removed, and a faithful man named Eliakim would be put in his place. Eliakim would be given the keys of authority to administer the kingdom on behalf of King Hezekiah. Eliakim is a type of Jesus who holds the keys of authority. Now, when I talk about having the key, how many of you want the key? Now, there are five keys we're going to talk about this morning. The first is the key of knowledge, the authority of the word. Luke chapter 11, verse 52 says, Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, do not, and you hinder those who were entering. In Mark 1, 22, he says, They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them with one having authority and not as one of the scribes. See, the key of knowledge. First off, we need to understand that there's authority in the Word of God. We've been talking about it pretty consistently since the beginning of the year, that we want to add that into our lives, where we have the Word of God, the authority of the Word of God, in our hearts, that David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. We learned in the example of Jesus that the authority of the word of God quieted every single temptation. Everything the enemy threw against him, he used that same weapon. It is written. The authority of the word of God to quench the deceptions, the trials, the temptations of the enemy. We need to understand that this key of knowledge... The authority of the Word of God needs to be in our lives, needs to be something that we possess. And I want you to understand something. Not only must we possess it, we must be willing to use it. Because you can possess all you want if you don't use it for what it's designed for. If you don't use it for the purpose that God has given it to us. To rebuke the enemy, to speak things that are not as though they are. To bring salvation to the world. If we do not use the knowledge, the authority of the word of God for its divine purpose, it's useless. 
I know a lot of people that have a lot of, a lack of a better term, head knowledge. They can quote the scripture. They can tell you chapter and verse where it's found. They can read it to you in the Greek, the Hebrew. They can read it in the Aramaic. They can give you this translation and that translation. But they do not have the authority of the Word of God. It is not, because we need to understand something. When we refer to the Word of God in this context, it is not some word on the Bible. It is the living Word of God. Quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. What happens in our lives is sometimes we just say it. What happened here in Luke, the scribes and Pharisees, they reserved that knowledge for themselves. First off, it was never designed to be that way. It wasn't supposed to be an, an exclusive scribe, Pharisee, priest, um, leader that only knew the Word of God. The knowledge of the Word of God, it's the first off, Jesus said that you yourselves didn't enter in. So you weren't entering in. You didn't use the key of knowledge to enter into right relationship. You didn't use the key of knowledge to deliver. You didn't use the key of knowledge to set free. You didn't use the key of knowledge to save, strengthen, encourage anybody around you. Not even for yourself. And because of your arrogance, because of your pride, because of your desire to be better than everybody else, you hindered those who were going in. That's why Jesus called them blind leaders of the blind. They did not use the Word of God for what it was designed for. Jesus compared spiritual knowledge to a temple. And that they should lead the people into the temple. But because of some misnomer, because, and I have to tell you, it was in the church for many years. Many, for many years, pastors, preachers, teachers, priests, all taught that don't read the Word of God for yourself. It'll make you go crazy. You need to have a knowledge, you need to have insight, you need to have time, you need to have all these things so that you could enter into that presence where you could read and understand. And so, for years, the authority of the Word of God was closed and locked. Then around 1600s, thereabouts, the Reformation began. Luther nailed his 91, 95 thesis, thank you. Uh, I'm Adora Wittenberg. Haas translated the Bible into English so that everybody could read it. It began to change. The Word of God was coming back. The authority, and we we moved to where we are today, where we understand the authority of the Word of God, but we need to learn what it is to know it and to walk in it. You simply cannot say this is what I believe. You can't simply say it has to be something that's instilled inside of you. And when you do, the key of knowledge, the authority of the Word of God, will change every situation. In Mark 1.22, he said they were astonished at the doctrine. He taught them as one. Now, who, who had authority? Jesus understood what this authority was. He didn't have to quote, hey, you know, uh, Billy Graham says, Jensen Franklin says, Kenneth Copeland says, Jesus spoke with the authority. He had the authority and the knowledge of the Word of God. And I want you to understand something. Scripture, Jesus himself said, all power and authority is given unto me. I give it to you. Now, okay, that's an interesting point. So it's been given to me. What and how do we walk in the authority of the Word of God? What, how, do we have, how do we go beyond head knowledge and have the authority that comes with the written Word of God? The, or even more importantly, the rhema of God, where a word becomes real to you. Where it has something, it's greater than just written, it's now become, the word rhema is a revelation, a personal a bringing to life of that particular word. So that God will give you the weapon that you need to be victorious in battle. As believers, especially in this generation, and especially in the United States, 
you have, we have the Word of God, the Bible, any way you want. I, on my laptop, I probably have, I have like 36 translations. Um, and you know, that's only a few of them. You can find all the more you want. It's available everywhere. You can buy them for a dollar or several hundred dollars. The Word of God is there. What we need to understand is we need to recognize the authority of the Word of God. Now, what does that mean? Simply, it means that we put our faith in what Christ said. If he said, I'm a conqueror, I'm a conqueror. If he said, he's a healer, he's a healer. If he said, fear not, I won't fear. If he said, don't be anxious, I'm not going to be anxious. We need to learn, and when we begin to walk in this authority, listen to me, when we begin to walk into this authority, we can bring others into that authority. The problem is, we want to bring someone in, and we haven't unlocked the door ourselves. We know the word, we can quote scripture, but we don't walk and understand the authority that comes with it and the authority that God's given us. And in doing so, we cannot bring anyone else into that place with us because we don't know how to get there ourselves. But we need to understand. And I made it specific. The first key is the key of knowledge. Why? Well, first off, you need to understand the knowledge that Christ came into the world to die for sinners of Hawaiian chief. That's the beginning. The key of knowledge brings us to salvation, but it'll bring us to our destiny as well. Number two, the key of the kingdom of heaven, the authority of salvation. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He gives us power to receive answers in prayer and extend salvation to others. But I want you to understand something. Then here we're talking about the authority of our salvation. Once we're saved, he goes on to say, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Those are pretty big words. How many of you even understand what it means to bind something? And what is it talking about here? Here, Jesus is specifically speaking to Peter. He gives him the power to bind and loose. But later on, further on in the book of Matthew, he releases that power and authority to all his disciples. This refers to answers to prayer, to extend salvation to others. The keys of the kingdom were given to Peter. What did he use? When did he use? What? How did he use these things? Well, Peter opened the way of salvation to the Jews first on his first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. He was instrumental in bringing the salvation to the Samaritans and the filling of the Holy Ghost, and he was the first to preach salvation to the Gentiles. When we talk about these keys of the kingdom, the authority of salvation is that God has given it to us all. Freely you received, freely give. Now those of you who went out last um, Sunday afternoon, or those of you who were just listening for a little bit on Sunday morning, um, we talked about the word kara, C-H-A-R-A, in the Greek. And that word meant joy, power, overwhelming pleasure. But I want us to understand why this authority, the key of the kingdom of heaven, is so important. How many of you, we've all read the scripture, the joy of the Lord is my strength. All right, how do you get the joy of the Lord? Is it praise? Maybe. Is it worship? Maybe. Is it doing something nice to somebody? Could be. But I will guarantee you this. Scripture says that there is more joy in heaven. Power. 
this excitement, this power of the Lord, this strength that we all need. There's more joy in heaven when one sinner gets saved than 99 who never need to be re, uh, redirected back to the Lord. There's more joy in heaven when one sinner gets saved than the 99 who sit in the house in the right place with God. Now that sounds a little unfair, doesn't it? Come on, I've been 99 of us have been doing this for a long time. That doesn't sound right to me. I remember the story of the prodigal son. Brother came home, father rejoiced. Older brother got mad. Simply because his words were, I did everything right. I've been, I've been a 99 for a long time. How come he didn't rejoice over me? He said, everything I have is yours. Your bad attitude, he didn't really say that, but that's what it comes down to. It's your bad attitude. Everything I have is your son, but your brother was dead. And he's alive. He was lost. Now he's found. We should rejoice. Be excited about that situation. And that's how the joy of the Lord, the authority of salvation comes into our lives. And I want you to know. Now, Chad shared that he spoke to some people, ministers and other things, that claimed that... Um, so when he wasn't there calling. I, I'm not even sure how to respond to that. Because <laughs> while Jesus said he gave to the church the fivefold ministry, pastor, I'm sorry, pastor, prophet, teacher, preacher, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, <coughs> apostle. apostle. He gave those fivefold. But he never did he say, well, if you're an apostle or a pastor or a teacher, your job is not to share your faith. It doesn't come. That, that, that might not mean my job is to do huge crusades, to run to the streets every single week. But I want you to understand something. The first responsibility of every single believer is to be a minister of reconciliation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, I have called you to be a minister of reconciliation. There are no ways out. I don't care what you do. Well, and I listen to me. I talked to Chad afterwards. He said, well, there are pastors that say, well, you know, it's not my job. Sheep beget sheep. Everything, everyone reproduces after their own time. Well, that might be true. But as a shepherd, you still are a sheep of the great shepherd. The most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. We're all called to share our faith. We're all called to have the authority of salvation, the keys to the kingdom. And I want you to understand why he calls them the keys to the kingdom. Because the Pharisees locked the door and didn't bring anybody in. But we're excited. We're thrilled that we've come to know Jesus. We know where we've been, and we're grateful that we're no longer going to hell. And we unlock the door to bring others into the kingdom with us. Amen? The keys Amen. of the kingdom of heaven. Sorry. That's okay. The key to the bottomless pit. <laughs> now this one's pretty cool. I love this. Now, Jesus said, all power and authority I have given unto you. Now, this bottomless pit is mentioned twice. It's authority over the devil. I want you to understand, you and I have a power and authority above all the power of the enemy. Paul tells us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, so they're pulling down a stronghold. That there are principalities of power, spiritual wickedness in high places. All these things are arrayed against us. It would be awful to have the power of the kingdom of heaven. It would be awful to have the power of salvation and not have power over the enemy. The verse we studied this morning, Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yes, you'll have tribulation. Yes, you'll have trials in this world. But I have overcome the world. And what he's really saying when he tells us that is, I have victory in the world, so you can have victory in the world. Revelation 9:1 it says, And a fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth. And he was given the key to the bottomless pit. Uh oh. How many of you know who that star is that fell from heaven? Say? Lucifer. Oh, star of the morning. And 
what happens here is he's given the key to release his own armies from this, lack of a better term, intermediate place of punishment. If you read Luke chapter 8, verse 31, when Jesus was speaking to the demons, they begged not to be sent there. And that's going to happen when God releases it. But as of right now, as of right now, Satan had the key. He opened the bottomless pit. And he has dominion and power. Revelation 20, verse 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. Now, I love this. This is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture because it, it just signifies the power and what this key, this authority over the enemy has. I, I love that verse that says, I saw an angel coming out of heaven. How many of you know, if, if it was me, I would think you would send Michael the archangel, right? The most powerful angel in all of heaven. If you read Jude, he contended. Michael was such a powerful angel. He contended with Lucifer for the body of Moses. Wow. Lucifer's a pretty powerful guy. And I love what happened. If you ever read the book of Jude, how many of you know, how many of you know how Michael got the body of Moses? Don't shut it out. Just raise your hand. How many of you know how he was able to defeat Satan. Any hands? One. Two. Listen to this. Somehow, in, in a way I can't understand, Lucifer and the great Archangel Michael, the most powerful in, angel in all of heaven, they are somehow in in the supernatural and the spirit well, they are pitted together in an eternal struggle for the body of Moses. And finally, finally, Michael pulls out the big guns. And the reason I'm sharing this story is because you have the big gun. Mm. Michael looks at Lucifer, square in the eye. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boom. Up goes the body of Moses. That was it. No more fight. No more battle. See, oftentimes we are trying to be in this eternal struggle, whether it's within our own hearts, our own minds, whether it's a spiritual battle that we appear to be in. But we need only, only to take the authority over the devil that God has given us in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, Satan. I have the victory. That's all it takes. He's given us power over all the power of the enemy. Back to my little angel here. I love this one. So first, for the body of Moses, he sends Michael the archangel on that battle. To bind Satan, it says, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain to bind Satan. Now, how I see this, see, he didn't call Michael, he didn't call Gabriel, and if you're one of those, he didn't call Raphael. He's really not mentioned in Scripture, but there are people who believe in Raphael. He didn't call any of those. What he did was call Mandy, the little choir, the little choir angel that sat in the back, shy, insecure, didn't look very mighty and powerful, but she called up Mandy, Mandy, go get Satan in the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what this angel does. This angel, from sitting in a little corner, the back seat in the choir of heaven, an unnamed person with no great power, with all the authority, all the power necessary, because he sent them in the name of Jesus Christ. And bound the enemy, threw him into the pit, and locked it for a thousand years. I think that's very, very important because I want you to understand something. You don't have to be Michael to have power over the enemy. You don't have to be Gabriel, Raphael. 
Heck, you don't even have to be an angel from the back seat in the choir. All you need to be is in right relationship with Jesus Christ and exercise the authority He has given you. All power and authority is given to you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every weapon shall come to naught. And I want you to understand something. Not only this spiritual, whatever it was all, he goes on to say, and every word that's spoken against you shall be condemned. See, the authority over the devil. And I want you to understand why that's important. We either, either in the Christian church, we do one or two things. We give Satan credit for everything. And he's bigger and more powerful than we are, so we're weak and ineffective. Or we're way over here and we say stuff like, gee, there must have been a lot of demons around when Jesus was around, huh? We don't really believe in evil. We don't really believe in devils today. You know, we give it a name and everything today has a name rather than being a, a spiritual force in our lives. It's a sickness, it's a disease, it's this, it's that. And I'm not saying that some of those sicknesses and diseases aren't real. No way, no shape, no form. But I want you to understand that a lot of those things, we just choose to name it now instead of battling in a spiritual realm. But we have all authority over the devil. First Peter tells us, that Satan isn't bound right now. But Job tells us that Satan can only, only do what God allows. And how many, I want to ask you a question right here, right now, and I'd like you to answer if you can. What power and authority does the enemy, Satan, have over a believer's life? As much as you give him. That's it. Nothing more. No more. He is not greater and stronger. He only has the power that you have relinquished to him. So if you're not willing to give him any place, he'll have no place in your life. He'll have no power. He can whisper in your ear. And you know what happens when he whispers in your ear? You repeat the words of Christ. Get thee behind me, Satan. It is written. Get to behind me. It is written. That's the authority we have over the enemy. Number four. Right? Four. The keys of hell and death. Authority over death. And the living one. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, And the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Psalm 68.18 speaks of Jehovah and says, Jehovah, you have ascended on the high, on high, you have led captives, your cap you have led your captives, you have received gifts among men, even among rebellious, so that the Lord may dwell there. What we want to understand is that here we're talking about both physical and spiritual death. Jesus has absolute power over both. When he said on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, he meant it. He, when he said in the garden that he didn't want to face this, he knew what was coming. But scripture says that he went to Hades. He went to hell and he took captivity captive. Now I want you to understand that very simply. Before Calvary, before Calvary, we, the faithful or the righteous didn't go to heaven. Because Satan had dominion over death. Well, when Jesus rose from the dead, it says he took captivity captive. It means he grabbed all the righteous. Now, let me see if I give you a, uh, a short history lesson. In Jewish tradition, it was called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And what it was was a... place in heaven. In, um, now, 
my daughters will correct me if I get this wrong, so that's all right. Uh, in Greek and, and Roman mythology, it was the Elysian Fields. That's correct. But they were still under the dominion of Hades, Hades the god of darkness. Why? Because in context, those Elysian fields, that place of paradise, that place of Abraham's bosom, had not yet been redeemed by Christ. But what happened is Christ came down, he gave Satan a black eye, and he took all his friends with him up to heaven. He has all power and authority over death, hell, and the grave. I believe James says, death, where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy sting? No longer is death something we worry about. No longer is it something for us to fear, simply because that authority is given to us. Does that mean we don't have to die? No. <laughs> and yes. What? We're all going to die a natural death or be transformed, period. But there's nothing for us to fear. For us, as believers, dying is simply the turning of the page. It's another chapter in our life. We just in the fifth key this morning. And the, oh, there we go. <laughs> the keys to the house of David. Now, I got to tell you, how many of you want this one? You see what it says? The keys of the house of David is authority over your circumstances. Now, we read Isaiah chapter 20, uh, 20 yeah, 20, 22, and we read Isaiah 9, 6 already. Understand what was going on here. In, in Revelation 3, verse 7, it says, And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things, say, saith he that is holy, and he that is true. He hath given ye the key of David, what you open, no man shutteth, and what you shutteth, no man can open. People sought after Jesus endlessly because Jesus had the power over their situation and their circumstances. The key of the house of David is victory and authority over your circumstances. In this particular case, he gave, in Isaiah 20, he gave Eliakim um, authority over the nation of Israel. And he refers to it as the key of the house of David would rest on his shoulders. And I want you to understand what that means. Scripture says, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, and he shall be wonderful counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting father. Whatever the situation you're in, God has authority over it. And he's given that to us. Just let me give you a quick example. So I'm trying to wrap this up. But let's understand, people sought after Jesus all the time to deal with them in their life situations. Let's quickly look at Matthew 9, 27. Come on, find it in the Bible. Flip, flip, flip. I don't have any pages going. Turn my eye. 927. Jesus went from there. Two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, O son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him and said, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. He touched them, saying, It shall be done according to your faith. I have to tell you, they were in a tough situation. They did not really have surgeries. They couldn't do corneal transplants. They didn't have any other option right here, right now. They had nothing. But because of the circumstances of their lives, they saw after Christ. And Jesus healed these two blind men. In Matthew 15, verse 22, um, it speaks of the Canaanite woman with a demon-possessed daughter. Supernaturally oppressed. Jesus ministered to her in the midst of her circumstances. Amen. Matthew 10, 10, 47, blind Bartimaeus. A little bit different, 
And I want you to understand, I love blind Bartimaeus. That story always gets me. Jesus says, this is where we need to understand what it is to walk in the authority of the key of the house of David. Because Jesus prays to heal Bartimaeus, and Jesus says, you're healed. And he says, go to the city, and go to the temple, and proclaim your healing. Well, he couldn't see yet. Can you imagine? Imagine how they mocked Bartimaeus as he walked through the city. I'm healed. I can see! Oh man, that felt a lot like a camel patty. Right? Banging, tripping, walking all over everything. But what it says is, because he exercised the authority of the key of David, authority over his circumstances, when he reached the other side of town, his sight was fully restored. Why is that important? Because I know a lot of believers in the midst of their circumstances, if God doesn't snap his fingers and change them, they look for another answer or go another direction. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. And then in Matthew 21, 9, all the people sought Jesus to become their king on triumphal entry. They wanted to raise him up as king. They wanted to raise him up as king because they didn't like the circumstances they were in. He has given us the key of the house of David. Power over whatever circumstances you are in in life. I want you to think about where you are right now. You're struggling financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. It doesn't matter where you are. Whatever the circumstances you're in, God has given you the authority, the key of the house of David. You have the authority over that circumstance. Now you need to exercise it. Well, I don't know what to do. All right, I'm going to give you a first to go. If you don't know what to do, you have to go back to the first key. Everybody, what was the first key? Say it. Knowledge, the authority of the Word of God. See, because it's in here. If you're sick, then you know how to be healed. If you need deliverance, you can't do what you do. If you need wisdom, you just ask for it. Then it's here, and you need to do it. But if you don't have the first key, then you're not going to know how to exercise the next key. And close the door or open the door, depending on what you need. Amen? I shared this this morning because these five keys will change your destiny. You will not have to be the same anymore. How many of you want to be the same? Even if you're doing great, how many want to do better? And how many, if you have enough, you want to have more than enough? How many of you want to have victory, you want to be more than a conqueror? Amen? Let's all stand this morning. You have a song for us? Somebody come up and sing with us. We all want to do this thing. As we sing, just grab a hold of these five keys. And allow the Holy Spirit to give you victory. And I know I would ask right now, before you even begin to sing, you know the biggest problem in your life. You know where you're struggling right now. You can have victory. Ask the Holy Spirit, what, which key should I be functioning? What key should I be using? What should I be opening and what should I be closing that I might have victory in this area in my life?
praying in our hearts. We lift up our hands to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the keys to victory in this life. Release to us the keys of knowledge, the key to the pit, the key of the house of David, that we might have the ability to, to deal with every circumstance and every situation. Which one do you want to be put in? No, just, just one. What's that? Whatever. Teach us. Lord Jesus, teach us, Holy Spirit, to walk in the power and authority you've given us. That everywhere we go, that circumstances, that principalities and powers, that darkness would flee from our presence, that sickness would yield to the name of Jesus, that fear and insecurity would be driven as we exercise, as we use the keys that you've given us. Lord, we thank you this morning. And we ask that as we leave here today, that we leave with a new understanding, with a new enlightenment, that you have given us keys to possess our inheritance, keys to possess the land, keys to walk in victory, keys to cause the enemy to flee or to be found. We ask as we leave today, Lord, that this word would take root into every life and every heart. That we begin to practice it daily. Change us from glory to glory. In Jesus' name.